YouTubers, thrill seekers, small gerbils, and people named Bob. Hello, greetings. It is I, your favorite obscure social studies teacher with just slightly above average looks, intelligence, and style, Mr. Palumbo, and this is the Professor Liberty Podcast. How's everybody doing out there? I hope everyone's having a great day. Thank you for tuning in, as always. I definitely uh, appreciate it. If you'd like to email the show, the email is professorliberty1776 at gmail.com. Don't forget to go to Apple iTunes and give me a five-star rating. And if you leave me a written review, depending on what you say, and let me know about it, I will send you a free, no charge to you, Professor Liberty sticker. Okay, so on to the show. You know, I was checking the analytics for the podcast. And, you know, one of the things it does is it tells you who's listening and what episodes are popular. And it talks about where people are listening. And I was shocked. Well, not really shocked. But I found it interesting that over the past few weeks, Canada and Ukraine have been listening to the show. Now, Canada has listened to the show on and off, uh, you know, a few downloads here, a few downloads there. However, Ukraine's new to the international Professor Liberty scene. I just find that interesting because both Canada and Ukraine are struggling for liberty right now in their own way. We see Canada, a lot of truckers in Canada using their right to peaceful protest which is enshrined in our Bill of Rights, by the way, but we'll get to that a little later. You know, in our Bill of Rights, it says, we have a right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And we also have a right to peacefully assemble. That's in our Constitution. I don't actually know if it's in uh, Canada's Constitution. I always call Canada, Canada. So if I say that again, my brothers up north, please forgive me. I say Canada, Canada, I don't know, maybe it's too many N's and A's, I I don't know. I think this shows, once again, that our Constitution is not a purely national document, or at least let's say the ideas in our Constitution are not a purely national document. The rights guaranteed in our Constitution are international. If you're a human being created in the image of God, you are guaranteed certain rights, Now, Ukraine is a whole different matter. Ukraine is dealing with outside pressures, namely Russia, and Ukraine wants to be a sovereign, independent country with language, borders, culture. Yes, borders are important if you want to maintain your sovereignty as a nation, but that's for a whole other podcast. I just think it's fascinating that Canada and Ukraine have been listening to this podcast, and I hope my words bring you edification, encouragement, and courage to keep moving forward. Okay, so let's discuss the Bill of Rights. We're going to start a new series called the Bill of Rights, where I go through each of the Ten Amendments and we talk about them. But today I wanted to just talk about the Bill of Rights, and uh, I thought it would be prudent to just give you some background, if you will. Why is there even a Bill of Rights to begin with? Where did it come from? Well, the year was 1787, all right, so... You know, enter the dream music. So it's 1787. And uh, before this, the time just before this, the young United States had been operating under a document called the Articles of Confederation. When you think of confederation, I want you to think of a partnership among independent nations. So when you hear the word confederacy, You know, no, 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 don't think a bunch of racists or rednecks or Southerners or Confederate flags. When you think of Confederacy, the reason the South called themselves the Confederacy was that was the that was the government. That was the government system that they set up. A Confederacy is a cooperation model where there's no real hierarchy in regards to law. No one is above no one else. Everyone is equal and they all have to agree to do something. This is one of the reasons why the South would eventually lose the Civil War. The main reason was their lack of manpower and supplies. It was a battle of attrition, and you can't fight a battle of attrition when you're losing 30% of your army every battle. 
But I, but I think there's, there's, their form of government also was a contributing factor because when Alabama needed supplies, it couldn't, it couldn't force Virginia to help. All the southern states were independent of each other. You see, under Confederacy, the states can decide to follow the rules or not. States are under no obligation to do whatever the central government tells them. States have their own currency. They have their own representative governments. They have their own tax revenues. They're only tied to the other states by kind of a gentleman's handshake, in a sense. Well, obviously, this makes governing nearly impossible, as you can imagine. How do you get things done if the various states don't want to help or don't comply? And this is where the United States, the young United States, found itself, a central government that had no power. What's interesting about the Constitutional Convention, little fun fact, is that it wasn't supposed to be a gathering to completely change the articles. It was supposed to improve upon the Articles of Confederation. It was supposed to fix. Well, I guess the articles were so unsalvageable that they just decided to create an entirely new government, and that is what came out of the Convention of 1787. Anyhow, this new convention set up a federal system, something never tried before, where state and federal governments would, quote, share, unquote, power. Some powers would go to the feds, some powers were reserved only to the states, and some powers both the states and feds did together. Now, what's neat about the Constitution is it's relatively short. In all honesty, I'm not even sure, and I'll talk about this a little later, I'm not sure how the United States became one of the largest governments in the world with such a short charter. I mean, we're talking, we're talking a few pages. We're talking seven articles. We're talking just under 5,000 words. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. When it comes to, when it came to approving this new constitution, which is called ratification, the framers began to divide into two camps. You might remember these names from your junior high history class. The two groups were called the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Now, the Federalists wanted the Constitution ratified, hence their name. The Constitution puts forth a federal system, and that's what the Federalists wanted. The Federalists wanted a more efficient government. Ha, ha, ha. Sorry. The Anti-Federalists didn't like the Constitution, or they thought it gave too much power to the central government. Now, I don't want to get too philosophical here. But let's talk about power for a second. Power is kind of like energy. You learned in physics class that energy can't be created or destroyed. It just changes into something else, into some other form of energy. Well, power is similar. To gain power, one must take it from someone or somewhere else. You can't create power. There's a set amount of power. Power is fixed in a sense. So in this case, if the delegates approved this new constitution, they would be giving power to a federal government at the expense of the state governments. Power is also taken from the people and given to the governments. This is why I harp on things like this so much. The more power you give to the government automatically means the less power you have. Power must be taken. So the Anti-Federalists saw this new constitution as a threat to their own state's sovereignty and their own personal liberty, and so, in general, they opposed its ratification. Some of the more famous Anti-Federalists were people like Patrick Henry, Samuel Adams, and James Monroe. Thomas Jefferson was an Anti-Federalist in spirit. He often doesn't get labeled as such because He had very little contribution to the Constitution, seeing that he was out of the country during its creation. Uh, Most of his uh, influence is going to come by the way of James Madison, who was a close friend. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was kind of like a mentor to James Madison, which is funny because they're going to fall on different sides of this topic. Thomas Jefferson was an anti-federalist. 
James Madison, who's known as the father of our Constitution, clearly, if you're going to be the father of the Constitution, you must be a Federalist. So even they themselves are going to fall on different sides of this issue. Some notable Federalists are, I just said, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton was one, and John Jay. George Washington, who, kind of like Thomas Jefferson, wasn't officially labeled as a Federalist. He did tend to agree with them more. And that's why some textbooks will label him as a Federalist, and others will say he didn't belong to a political party. But just like how Jefferson was an anti-Federalist in spirit, old George was a Federalist in spirit. Now, one thing I hope you history buffs have noticed is that this issue divided the founding generation. We have future presidents in both camps, for example. Now, surely one side can't be the bad guy and one side the good guy. They were all patriots. We can't challenge any one of these guys' courage or patriotism. And that's because of the fact that good men were on both sides. I think this is why you're going to come to the Bill of Rights Compromise. That's right, boys and girls. The Bill of Rights was a compromise. The shock, the horror. Is that even possible? The truth of the matter is that the Constitution with its seven articles wasn't going to be ratified. It was only going to be ratified on the agreement that there would be amendments to it. These ten amendments are what we call the Bill of Rights. Now, we've already discussed what the underlying issue is, but I want to kind of unpack this further. The underlying issue of the entire debate was mistrust. Well, I don't want to say, maybe it's not the issue, but the sentiment, right? The feeling, the experience was mistrust in government. If you look at the Constitution, the government is divided up so many ways because the framers feared more than anything the concentration of power. But the real issue or question was, is a Bill of Rights even needed? James Madison didn't think so. He thought if it's not written in the Constitution, then the federal government has no say in the matter. Which, let's be honest, that's a fair point. But how is that working out in practice? There are tons of issues that the federal government is involved in that the Constitution does not mention. So in this case, I have to say, the anti-federalists seem to have been proven correct. However, the flip side of this argument by the federalists, which is also a solid point, is that if we write down specific rights to be guaranteed by the Constitution, doesn't that imply that those are the only rights protected? Another good point. Basically, think of it like this. If we start per listing you know, specific rights... Are those the only ones that get, you know, you know, that get protection, that get guaranteed? So as we dive into the Bill of Rights over the next few weeks, I just want to start off by acknowledging a few things about the Bill of Rights. Number one, the Bill of Rights was the quintessential contribution of the anti-federalists. In other words, we have the Bill of Rights thanks to the efforts of the anti-federalists. And as our government continues to grow and go outside the bounds of the Constitution, one could only imagine how worse it would be now if there was not explicit words like, shall not be infringed. Heck, even with those explicit words, people's rights aren't consistently protected. Number two, the framers were dealing with a difficult issue. How do you get enough power to the central government to make it somewhat efficient without taking away precious liberty from states and subsequently the people. That's a difficult conundrum. Personally, I think they did about as good as anyone could do. I often say that federalism, though it might be on life support, has saved us from government overreach and tyranny many, many times. For example, our executive, the president, has limited and defined powers, and we should thank God for that. Now, the other branches might not consistently hold his feet to the fire, 
but at least there's mechanisms and traditions in place to indeed hold his feet to the fire. Number three, the Bill of Rights was a compromise, as I said earlier. In politics, you're never going to get 100% of what you want. And as our nation continues to divide on ideological grounds, it seems like compromise is now an impossibility. But that wasn't always the case. Men of honor who had different opinions had the maturity enough to fight for what they wanted, but then also agree to certain concessions. And imagine if we could still do that today. Finally, number four, I'd like to say that at this point in history, it seems pretty clear that the anti-federalist prophecies of government tyranny were correct. As I mentioned earlier, how can a constitution with seven articles, a document with just under 5,000 words, spawn the largest government apparatus in human history? It's because the government grows. Power loves to concentrate. The framers knew this, and they tried their darndest to prevent it, but what can you do? Clearly, the Articles of Confederation were ineffectual, and we must agree that a somewhat efficient government is a necessity. But the fact of the matter is the Constitution is only a piece of paper. It takes men of virtue, self-discipline, and honor to remain faithful to it. Those type of men aren't really around anymore. John Adams, a Federalist, noted that the Constitution was made for a moral and religious people and that it is wholly inadequate if that's not the case. I'm paraphrasing. Ben Franklin, the oldest delegate at the convention, he was 81, was asked by someone in the crowd after the Constitution was ratified, what sort of government has the delegation created? He replied, quote, a republic if you can keep it. I think clearly the framers didn't go in there or they didn't come out of the convention with rose-colored glasses. These were learned men. These were men that knew Greek history, knew Roman history. Many of them spoke Latin. They were, they were classically educated. They knew history. And history is just a long list of what bad government does. So I don't think they came out of here with a hallelujah moment. I think they were pragmatists and they compromised, and they tried to find the best way to make an efficient government without sacrificing liberty. Here at Professor Liberty, we seek to educate, inspire, and restore. If you like this podcast, please give me a five-star rating at Apple Podcasts. Also, if you're interested in seeing some of my activities and my lessons, please go to TeachersPayTeachers.com, and you can help uh, me financially by purchasing some of my activities and lessons. If you'd like to email the show, the email is ProfessorLiberty1776 at gmail.com. Until next time, folks, go throughout the land and proclaim liberty.